Welcome to Sales Talk for CEOs. I'm glad you're here. I'll be interviewing CEOs who have successfully scaled their B2B sales organization. In each episode, I'll start by uncovering the sales background of each CEO, dig into the strategies they use to build their sales organization, and wrap it up with what the future holds. We'll cover the good, the bad, and the ugly of scaling a sales organization. I'm your host, Alice Hyman. Welcome. Today, I am really excited to be talking to someone who has worked for many companies, but then about three years ago, built her own. She has a sales background and she is an absolute expert in LinkedIn, which you should all be using if you're not already. Take advantage of all the great things you can do with it. And we may even get into some of that today. But I am very excited to welcome Sam McKenna from Sam Sales. Welcome. Thanks, Alice. Thank you so much for having me. How nice to be here. Well, Let's just start by having you tell us a little bit about what Sam Sales does, and then we'll rewind and learn about what gave you the idea to start that company and go through how you grew your sales. Oh, we so we do a lot, and uh, everything really came out of client demand. We started in consulting and then realized there was so much more we could do. So we do a ton of BDR trainings, ton of AE trainings, everything from a sales perspective. We're agnostic to any methodology to really teach you the nitty gritty of all the stuff that you're supposed to do. We do secret writing. We do LinkedIn executive branding for some pretty cool executives and entrepreneurs, um, and then do a bunch of speaking engagements. Um, I think I've did 30 of them, 20 of them in eight weeks, no, 30 of them in eight weeks in 2021. And I will never do that again. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but always really nice to, to be on stages, get out there and get to meet people in person too. So there's a, there's a lot we've got cooking on our side. So it sounds like you're focused on helping companies increase their sales. And it sounds like you spend a good amount of your time at the early part of the sales cycle or buy cycle where uh, people are reaching out and getting to know people. And they do that by prospecting, obviously, with BDRs and SDRs, business development reps and sales development reps, and then also by building their own brand, which um, I know you are a huge believer in how important that is. Absolutely. I think what's interesting, and you see this too, Alice, I know, right? We think about all the things that are kind of let's say, not say broken, but there's opportunities for growth right across every sales team. And to me, yeah. it always comes back to the foundations, right? We ask about, you know, how can I negotiate and how do we close multi-year deals for hundreds of millions of dollars? I'm like, let's talk about that. But how are your discovery calls? And they're like, oh, they're garbage. And I'm like, cool, maybe <laughs> we focus on that first. So we really love focusing on the foundations because I think for the most part, that is where we always have opportunity for growth, right? When we talk to CROs or we talk to heads of sales, it's, I have a pipeline problem. We have a conversion problem. Our disco to second call doesn't convert very well. Why? And so we really focus on that, how to be human, how to be kind, how to just, you know, prospect for quality versus sending a thousand emails and hoping for the best. Right. Um, but yeah, really at that entry level. Quality over quantity. All we really have to get that into the minds of the CEOs and sales leaders out there. The, um, uh, quantity approach is no longer working and we really need to stop it. More, more, more isn't going to work. We have to do better. And that means we have to focus and we have to make high quality touches to fewer people. And I just really think that this has been a long time coming, but the pandemic sped it up. Yeah. And now we really have to focus on the buyers and how they want to buy and we can be much more successful when we focus and we, you know, don't try to sell to everyone and we cut the quantity out and just go with very high quality touches. I have seen it working beautifully totally. uh, when companies do it. I think it's interesting. Like, you know, there's of course transactional businesses where that doesn't make sense, right? It's a small right. contract value, et cetera. However, for the majority of our organizations, or yeah. especially those in tech, what you want to think about, I think it's actually a great question to even ask like leaders, frontline managers that in your interview, tell me a little bit about your style, quality over quantity and why. And what I find is that a lot of the leaders, right, still stick to quantity 
because they don't know how to do quality, right? So they yeah. stick to the things that they can be measured by and the things that will help protect their jobs or they can say, well, I don't know, we make a thousand calls a day, it doesn't work, must be the product, must be marketing, right. can't be us. Where instead, right. right, look for your leaders who say it's quality over above everything. Here's how we can write a great show me, you know me email. Here's how we can do our research. How, here's how we can connect with the buyer, get better open rates, get better response rates and yeah. bonus, build a great brand for our company instead of what the quality or the quantity does. Yeah. Don't want to be known as that company that spams you with email <laughs> or, or spams your LinkedIn. Or calls you so. incessantly. My, fa my favorite is a, a, data, a data company that calls and asks me um, if I would be willing to buy them at On24. And I'm like, well, you're a data, you're a data company um, that talks about jobs and you don't know that I haven't worked for On24 in five years. So hopefully not interested. <laughs> All right. So let's rewind. You have a very impressive career with On24, LinkedIn, and some others prior to starting your company. So take us back. And, and you had a sales career before starting your company, which is not the most common path, right, to founding a company. But I always love it when I find founders who came from sales. So walk us through a little bit like what you were doing, some different companies you worked with, and how you got this idea mm. to start Sam sales. And then how did you start it? I think like everybody else on the sales front, I've definitely fell into this role. I didn't want to do it. I even turned down the first job that I got in sales. Cause I was like, Ugh. right. Which I think a lot of people have that perception of sales, but I did really well. I shifted my perspective from selling to helping, which really just changed the lens for me. Right. Um, but so what were you doing? So what did, were you trained to do or what did you go to school to do and what did you think you were going to do before you got into the selling? I thought I was going to be in finance. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I can I really it. add, That's Alice. Great. So, um, I don't know, just kidding. But yeah, I thought I was yeah. going to be in finance. Um, I moved to DC after college, uh, and I actually helped open the largest pottery barn in Wash in the in the United oh, States. It was in Washington DC. Yeah, I was very excited about that. Um, I got into a marketing role like everybody else in 2008. I went through the the whole layoff thing, and then um, had a, a mentor here that offered me a job in sales, and and the rest was kind of history. Both my parents were entrepreneurs, and um, so I learned and I'm originally from Switzerland. So I learned a lot from them of building relationships, great manners, which is what's rooted uh, in all of our sales processes. Yeah. Um, and just kind of just how, frankly, how to people, uh, how to just be a good person, how to strike up a conversation, how to do your research. Um, got saw a lot of success as an, an individual contributor, got recruited over to On24. Um, and I knew, you know, in the, the last four years of my prior sales career, I constantly heard my leaders say, I never thought to do that. Or how did you get, you know, the ACV yeah. higher than normal? And I was like, well, and every time I would say something, people were like, oh, we never, that never occurred to us. And I'm like, why are you in that chair? And I'm in this chair. So I actually started posting in 2011 on LinkedIn. Um, and I started sharing my ideas. And when I got to on 24, I said, I know I want to be a leader. It, there is nothing more fulfilling to me than sharing a practice, teaching someone something, seeing them, seeing them execute and succeed. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I've carved a path out for myself for that. I think I got promoted in about two years, um, right after I got rep of the year the first time, um, and then got promoted, and then ultimately became the first person, not only woman, but person to get promoted from individual contributor to executive ranks in the company's 20 year history. Um, so wow. super proud of that. One of my one of the many, many records, I was very lucky to, to break in my career. And then yeah. got recruited over to, uh, to LinkedIn. Um, it's funny when they, they called and said, you should work here. I was, I was like, I mean, I guess when I was like, oh my God, what is happening? LinkedIn was like the holy grail for me. I was I'm so passionate about the product. Um, so got, got over there, um, helped build out an enterprise team in New York, um, broke my 13th record while I was there. And then that's when, when I thought about starting Sam sales for me, what, what really bleeds through my veins is making positive impact. How can we help somebody? How can we advance their career? How can we help yeah. them get deals? How we can how can we help a company grow? The the success and the money all comes after that. But to me, it's that's number one. So I thought, what if I can work part time, lol, uh, and make half the money that I made before, spend some more time with my dog and my now husband, and travel less? And so I started Sam Sales and thought, if if I can just impact two or three different companies that don't really know what they're doing with sales. Mm -hmm. That'll be enough for me. And I think that went out the window in about a week <laughs> after starting. Yeah. How's that kind of uh, so, working, not working out? <laughs> and uh, yeah, how's that working out? <laughs> not too much. <laughs> 
not so much. I know. I, I teach a, a class at the University of Nevada, mm -hmm. which is in the entrepreneurship minor, and oh. it's a sales class. And when I talk to the students about becoming, you know, owning a business, becoming an entrepreneur, and they all tell me, you know, oh, I want to work when I want to work and I want to do that. I'm like, oh, wow. Let me tell you about what my life looks like <laughs> as an entrepreneur. And then maybe you might want to go work for somebody else where you can actually work 40 or 50 hours a week and then be done. And then leave it at home. Yeah, or leave it at the office, office effectively. Happen, right? yeah, yeah. So it's always fun to hear uh, young people talk about why they want to start a business, right? <laughs> and sometimes they have like a real passion or drive around some specific thing. And I love that. But a lot of times their idea is just more about being in control of their own schedule. And I'm like, wow, yeah, don't do it it's for that not, reason. not going to work for you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. But anyway, um, okay. So you started the company, but before we go there for a second, I want to pause on how LinkedIn helped you became, how, to, how LinkedIn helped you become successful. And I think this is important for the CEOs out there listening. So everybody in the audience, all of the CEOs and all of those who support CEOs, uh, LinkedIn can play a very important role in developing individual brands as well as corporate brands. And many of you are underutilizing it, don't understand the importance, are not setting an expectation that your leadership team, your sales leaders, your whole go-to-market lead leadership team and all your go-to-market people would use LinkedIn properly. You are not really setting that expectation and therefore they don't. And so you are truly missing out on a lot of business probably that you could have, uh, which is interesting to me because it's really pretty simple to do. Yeah. So, um, Sam, tell us a little bit about how you started to figure out that LinkedIn could really help you build your brand and draw your ideal customers to you and, you know, share these ideas so, so the CEOs can hear them and look for the things that their leadership team and their go-to-market team should be doing, I will, their customer-facing people. I'll say just two things on that really quickly. So one, I want you to think about who you are as a business and, and your sales team. So you're in a position right now of one of two routes. One, either your competitors are using LinkedIn and you have to catch up, or they are not, and you have a competitive advantage, right? Yes. Regardless, if you don't take action, you're missing out on something significant. The other thing where I think a lot of people hesitate is, well, I don't, I don't want my reps and my leaders to be noodling around on social media. And where's the attribution going to come from? And I'll tell you, attribution's a hot mess anyway, right? Even, even if a rep has self-sourced a deal, let's say first touch, last touch, whatever, it might say marketing, you never really know. So who cares? The point is getting your brand out there, sharing thought leadership, sharing content gets you a yeah. wild amount of impressions. And that's what people are here to do on LinkedIn. They're here to learn, to network, and to figure things out. The other beautiful part about LinkedIn is just over 1% of the database on LinkedIn. I think we've got about 850 million members now, yours included, yours truly included. Alice, I know you're big about this as well, but only post once a week. Everybody else, at least half of the membership comes in once a week and stays at least five minutes. So if only 1%, just over 1% is posting weekly, and over half, 400 million members are coming in for at least five minutes. Yeah. They're coming to read. Give them content because if you don't, other people will, your competitors will, right? So to me, honestly, it just became a part of helping. So the reason that I started posting on LinkedIn in 2011 was getting that feedback from my leaders and then thinking, well, if, if my tips are useful to them, I guess they'll be useful to somebody else. So I started to post, right? I remember the first time I got 10 likes and I was like, I have made it. <laughs> I am... <laughs> I am good to go. I'm a celebrity. Yeah. Um, and then I remember um, when I really started to make an effort, I was like, well, maybe I'll post, you know, more often. Maybe I should do a hashtag, which is where Sam sales came from. And thank God I'm a seller and not a marketer because that's as creative as I got my name and what I do for a living. Um, but the very first time I posted that, um, somebody from Max's team at Sales Hacker reached out and said, this post was great. Would you write for us? And I was like, what? And I was so excited back in the day. And then they're like, here's six topics. I'm like, I'll write them all. And they're like, easy tiger. You can write one. Let's see how you do it. And I was like, okay. Um, but the great thing about this was that it was the only reason I started posting was truly to share my ideas and to help others. But what came of it, right, 
is that then I kind of earn the right with my network to share stuff about our company, to share things about our webinars, to teach people how to market, demand gen better, you know, all that stuff. And what I loved about this, right? Like when you think about what social selling can do, I would go back as an, as an IC and as a leader, I would go back through my posts and I would mine the likes and the comments for contacts and those created leads for our company. Very sadly, never for my team, but yeah. for tons. So what a great way for me also to stand out as an individual yeah. and as a leader by driving that revenue. Yeah. Pause right there. I think this is so important. I try to tell CEOs and senior leaders all the time, you can be the chief lead generator simply by putting yourself out there and putting out great content. You draw the people to you and then you can introduce them to your sellers to take it from there. I mean, what a great position to be in because we all need more leads. Salespeople Huge. all need more conversations with people who can potentially buy. And as leaders, why would you cut out that form of lead generation yeah. when you could be there doing that? You think about this too, right? Like think, think of our senior leaders as let, let's just call them celebrities, right? And let's put this in consumer yes. context, right? On Instagram, we wouldn't have a celebrity. You don't have Kim Kardashian on Instagram. Sorry for all the haters out there. I'm with you. Um, but you don't have Kim Kardashian posting her own pictures. You don't have her monitoring her own Instagram. She has a team for that. That's exactly right. one of the things that Sam Sales does. So for all of you who are thinking, I don't have the time, I don't know how the algorithm works, right. hell if I know what to write, we've got you covered. But the cool thing is, right, people are looking for new voices. So when we start to get some of our clients out there, not only are people taking notice, not only are their networks growing, not only do their impressions grow, but then they get tagged in other things, added to like, yeah. this is who you must follow lists. The cost per impression and cost per lead is like pennies on the dollar. Forget all the money you're spending on pay-per-click campaigns and SEO. And ads and yeah. Yeah. Put it directly into this because holy cannoli will pay off. I do have a big network. You know, I think I'm 56 or 57,000 followers. It has taken time to get there, but I will say two things. I have two posts from yesterday, over a hundred thousand views of those two posts collectively. Yeah. hundred thousand people have seen my name, maybe not my content, but my name. That's an amazing impression. And the other thing is if you are a CEO of a well-known company, you know, we have a very influential person at Meta that we write for. You don't even need to take the time to build your network. People are going to suck up to you in no time anyway. Just get your content out right. there. You know, build that visibility overnight. Yes, <laughs> it's amazing. And so building that network is probably what allowed you to be so successful at the beginning of your business. A lot of people start a company and they don't have sales right away because they don't have the network that they need. Yeah. You had already built that network through LinkedIn yeah. and through the various jobs that you had already had. And so when you launched, how did that help you to get your first sales? I had already built over those the course of those 12 years in selling enterprise sales and posting on LinkedIn. I'd already built the trust and the credibility. Oh my gosh, your dog. <laughs> I know. He just was asking me to pick him up. What's so his name? sorry, everybody. This is Landon. Hi, Landon. He sometimes likes to visit while I'm podcasting. Very so he's just fine made an appearance, but now. lovely to meet Landon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd already built that trust and credibility. People, people knew me, right? Or felt like they knew me. They knew my advice and it was consistent. The other thing yeah. that I systematically took time to do in all that that work on, on LinkedIn was build my recommendations up, right? You can even see this on our website under the resources section. Just Google, ugh, do I have to get LinkedIn recommendations? And the answer is yes, you have to. That, that article is aptly titled. But if you read those recommendations, even if you are an inbound lead, you've, you've been referred to me, you have no idea who I am. When you read yeah. those recommendations, it's the same old stuff. It's the same old stuff. Yeah. And why is the same old stuff? Because that's my brand. That's who I am. So that's what you can expect of me. And I'll say, like, I was very quiet when I launched Sam Sales. I, and I think there was definitely some, um, just some, some scaries, some trepidation, like, who is going to want to buy my services? Who's going to want to hire me? And I'll tell you, talk about, I mean, Alice, you know this, putting yourself at you. It's not a product you're selling. You are selling yourself. yourself. So when someone that's says right. no, they're like, Alice, I don't want to work with you. And you're like, okay. <laughs> and then you crawl under your desk. But that was, <laughs> there was definitely some trepidation. And when I let a small circle know, I had two clients immediately who said, we have absolutely no idea what we're doing with wow. sales. Can you help us out? And I was like, oh, and then that started in September. And then in November, I posted formally on LinkedIn. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to say that I started a business. And then people came out of the woodwork. It was it was overnight because they were like, we've always, we wish we could hire you. 
And now we can, because there's no conflict of interest and we can have at least some of your brain. Wow. And you grew very quickly. So <sighs> you're doing all the selling and the delivering yourself. Move us from there to, you know, what happened next and how did you get to where you are in terms of, you know, sales and delivery to grow to where you are today? I think something that's going to surprise somebody is we're an all women team of 11 and there's myself, there's our VP of sales, Sarah, and then my chief of staff who has a little bit of sales experience between Sarah and I, we're, we're bona fide sales experts. Everybody else on our team, no sales experience whatsoever. And I think what's interesting, wow. right. But, but think about this too, of like how we hire and how we source talent. So um, Kim Collins is our VP of enablement and strategy. She runs our entire BDR division and she speaks on podcasts. She does all this great stuff. She used to be a head of PR and communications for senators on the Hill. And when I was like, do you want to come help me figure out this business? She was like, I can't even spell the word sales, let alone do it. Um, but I think this was one of the important parts, right? But I quickly became overwhelmed and I'm like, I need somebody else to help me. So I mean, half of our business relies on Kim's incredible brain and her personality and all that stuff. Um, and then slowly just started to grow from there. Every single time I was behind my desk, like we talked about Alice, 12, 14 hours a day doing, you know, admin tasks on the weekends. I thought, what is it that I can carve off yeah. <clears throat> that doesn't need my brain and that somebody else can do so that we can systematically keep growing. And you can stay focused on what's mm -hmm. most important, which is your customers right. selling to them and delivering what they need. Now you have teams that help you do a lot of those things today, but you as the CEO are still focused on sales. And you know, uh, Sam, I always say to CEOs, you will always have a role in sales, yeah. but that role will change as your company matures and it should change. Yeah, right. Totally. And so your role changed from, you know, doing all the selling and delivery to now still doing some of that, but also, managing it as well, which you had done in your past at other jobs. Yeah. Um, and what were some of the things that maybe surprised you about trying to grow sales or grow a sales team that even though you had done it at other larger companies, now here at a small company without some of the support systems big companies have, what were some of the things that maybe surprised you or were more challenging than you thought they would be? I really miss my expense budgets. I will say that. <laughs> I'm sure you feel the same. Um, I think one of the things, it, it, it's the same thing that I think most people go through when they go from IC to leader. It's the it's the being comfortable with delegating. IC being independent contributor. <laughs> yes, it, it, right. Independent contributor or individual contributor, right, to to frontline manager. Um, you, you have to kind of put up those barriers of one, the things that you're going to delegate away, but number two, that you shouldn't be in the weeds of these sales processes, right? You shouldn't push the person aside and take over, which I know is really hard for a lot of frontline managers. Um, I think for me, when I brought Sarah on, so Sarah's our VP of sales and came on um, in June of this year, so she's been here just over six months, um, was, was one, underestimating two, how much time it takes somebody to ramp. Um, and Sarah has, yes. Sarah was a second line leader managing 50 people. She's, you know, president's club out of her mind. And when you bring somebody in, right, you kind of just assume, well, you're seasoned. Here's your book. Go get them, tiger. Um, <laughs> but there's so much to learn. Right. And I think that's also, that's, there'll be a great post for her to say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at this. And it still took me six months to, to fully ramp. So I yeah. think that was one of the learning curves. Um, two, I think the, the, the balance, you've got to find a balance too, from the sales people you bring on, um, your style is not the only style, right? So making sure that Sarah has, um, kind of the, the breathing room, uh, to be able to do her own thing, to manage the sellers and the BDRs on our team, her own way um, while weaving in some of that Sam sales stuff, right? She says, I was such a, I thought I was really good at my job, but there is so much I have to learn that you guys just do differently, right? Or social selling. I'm like, you should post on LinkedIn. Yeah. And she's like, I spend three hours thinking about a post. And I'm like, I get it. Um, right. So I, I think that too, making sure that there's that balance. So it's not all your process, but that person has their authenticity in it too. Yeah. Growing a sales organization is always interesting and everybody does it a little bit differently, yeah. you know, from using a channel and partners of some type to direct sales. Do you see your team currently, I think they're all doing direct sales. Do you see moving in, into any type of partner model in the future? We we have some great partnerships. So, uh, so people that refer business back to us, I will say like 
to me, part of our success and and how we've sold is no different to than what all of us should be doing as leaders and as individual contributors every day, right? And that's using data to our advantage. You just think about a couple of simple things that you can do, right? One, we talked about this, you and I, Alice, but the art of a proactive referral. Um, so finding your best clients, people who love you, people who maybe haven't purchased you here, but have purchased you over the years and just saying, who do you know? that could make use of our services, right? And starting to open those doors. So tracking yeah. the job changes of every single person that has ever interacted with you, bought with you, right. championed for you, used you. I mean, oh my gosh, sky's the limit, right? Average of what, 19 people involved in enterprise deals these days. So all of those people um, track their job changes. Where do they go? There's some really smart things that you can do to grow a business, which I think Partly what, right, that's what helped us grow where we closed our 160th client today, um, helped us grow, yeah, that that fast. Um, but it's, to me, it's not rocket science. And I, I think it's just a really cool game of Sherlock Holmes using data, building good relationships for the the long term. Um, and that's yeah. it. I will say one other thing, and, and I'm, I know you experience this as well, but I think one of the scariest things to do as an entrepreneur, it's the first time that we hire a cost center um, to our business, mm -hmm. right? So someone who does, who brings no re re real return ROI in terms of dollars, um, but does in right. terms of your sanity and your time and your weekends. <laughs> um, and I think that that was something I wish I'd taken maybe two or three months sooner um, a leap on because it's hard. You don't have an expense budget. You were literally paying for it out of your bank account. Um, so, but, it, but I think it's such a necessary thing to really properly do that division of labor um, and to get support in the areas that just don't need your talent there. Yeah, absolutely. And I really believe in working in your genius zone. You know, a, a lot of us work in our zone of excellence every day, which is awesome. Hopefully we don't work too often in our zone of incompetence, but of course we all <laughs> fall into that occasionally. But imagine if you work in your zone of genius as a CEO who's scaling a company, that means that you're spending the largest percent of your time doing what only you can do and what you do best. Yep. And that seems to me is what you are doing. You are really focusing on what you do best and delegating the rest, which is not easy as we all know. And it takes time because you don't just hand it over and the person can automatically do it. Yeah. Uh, it takes time for people to learn and grow and adjust um, into a role. But when we can do that and when we make ourselves do it, right, our time and our creativity gets freed up so that we can really scale our companies. Yeah. And I think that's just something that we miss sometimes. We think, oh, I can do it quicker myself or, oh, it's too much money or, you know, especially in the early days when we're growing, we have all these thoughts that hold us back from allowing us to, as CEOs, to work in our genius zone the majority of the time. So I think that your growth is due to the fact that you recognize that and you've been able to do it. Not perfectly, of course. And I've been doing it for many, many more years and I still don't do it perfectly, but it's amazing. And that really is a way to scale your growth that most CEOs don't even think about, right? Freeing themselves up to do what they do best. And you think about that, that investment of, you know, I could do it faster myself, but you think about that investment instead of, instead of taking three minutes to do this, I'm going to take nine minutes to teach them how to do it so that I don't have to spend three minutes 48 more times this year doing it, right? So, you know, or three hours. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think one other thing to keep in mind too is your your team isn't always going to feel the same confidence in themselves that you feel in them, right? So sometimes they're going to come to you and say, I could really use you on this call or, you know, can you look this over or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think too, think about who that person is that's asking and think, do they really need me? Is this just kind of a, like, I want you as a crutch there. Can they do this by themselves? Um, um, and I think oftentimes, right, when I when I push my my little birds out of the nest, um, they go in there like, oh my gosh, that wasn't so hard. And I'm like, no kidding. And thank God I didn't have to be on that call. Um, but I think all those things really pay off. And then to your point, you do get to be strategic. You get to think about the things, yeah. you know, revamping your website or adding content somewhere or writing a blog to help SEO, whatever um, that's really important to growing your business. Right. And case in point on you, having the salespeople use you wisely, if we train them how and when to bring us in as CEOs, then we can really have a major impact. 
And if we teach them to do a prep meeting prior to bringing us into the meeting, right? So that we are all prepared to do a really good job, then everyone's time is spent well and things go very, very well. Um, And I think sometimes, you know, when they are asking the CEO for their time with a customer, I mean, it's important to to make a good decision about whether the CEO should be there or not, but a five minute conversation about why, what are you worried about? What, what can I contribute as CEO can help them make a better decision about when to use the CEO and when they can just maybe get a little clarity or information and then go on and do it themselves. So I love that you are thinking like that. It's like, just because they ask you to be on a call doesn't mean you need to be on a call. And as a CEO, you're so busy, you have to help them use your time wisely. I think you can apply that same principle to so many different leadership um, instances. There's a a post that I made a couple months ago where um, Kim, our head of enablement, came and said, hey, do you have this link handy? And I can be the bottleneck as a CEO and say, I'm really busy. I'll get it to you in a bit. Or I I can kind of jokingly say, get it yourself. And what I, that's, that's kind of the clickbait that I used in my post. But what I really said is, I'm wrapped up on something, but Paige on our team has it. And so go get it there. And so what's interesting to me is like, I think a lot of people struggle with that delegation or talk to somebody else, or I'm not needed because it seems like you're too important, too busy, too whatever. But what you're actually doing, right, as a leader, the best kind of leader is to not always be the one with all the answers, but to encourage that peer-to-peer learning, right? So not only are they now building a better relationship, they might have information to share, and I keep focused on it. Now, if you're scrolling Instagram or TikTok all day and you're saying, go get it yourself, that's a whole different topic of conversation. But otherwise, right, you want to stay the course. Those distractions can really add up. Um, So think think that through too. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, all right, 2023 and beyond, where are you growing to? What additions will you make to your go-to-market team? And, you know, what are some of the things you're planning this year to focus on your customers and show them that you love them? (laughs) I I think this is, this question to me is like akin to the, um, like the couple, like that's been dating for four years and everyone's like, so where is this going? When are you going to (laughs) propose? Right. And you're like, Oh God, I haven't even thought about it. I I think, you know, I I think I, I tend to operate in a worse, I I set my goals around worst case scenarios, um, which I know seems strange. And then we always leap over those things, but, um, I would be so happy, honestly, if our, if our business stuck around for 10 10 total years. Let's say we all made a fortune together. We could pay off all the people who have been working for us, you know, hard and make them rich and then call it a day. Um, and that's about as far as I've set my, I know people are like, you're going to retire in seven years. And I'm like, hang on. Um, <laughs> probably not, but, but yeah. probably not. Um, but I, I think, you know, the thing to me, the way that we run our business, it's not about like the most ARR. It's not about how do we get the highest valuation? It's not about that. It's about making sure one, we keep everybody gainfully employed and just frankly doing something that we love with our time, right? When I recruited Sarah over, I was like, you're never going to have to be on a forecast call again. I'm like, that is one of the perks. And she was like, what do you mean? (laughs) And I was like, because I I just don't care, right? We've been successful. We have enough money. We can pay for these things. I don't need to know. I don't need to know on a quarterly basis. Everything's coming in. I just don't, nor do I, nor do I want to operate that way. So I think I might sound a little Pollyanna and too like cupcakes and rainbows, but that that's really, that's really what I want for us to do meaningful work that impacts people and makes us happy and just contributes to society in a positive way. Yeah. And you're just really focused on building successful customers. Can, can the customers take what you've given them and be successful with it, which I believe is what is going to make every company successful. It's a sustainable way to do business rather than focusing on revenue. Like you said, like, okay, revenue is important, But when we focus solely on revenue, we take away the focus from our customer Mm. and successful customers always lead to revenue. There's no other path. So if you ultimately just focus on making successful customers, they can use what you've sold them. They have high user adoption. They're, they're hitting their goals because they're using what you sold them, they're right? Enthusiasts. Like they're enthusiasts. Like they'll, they'll they brag about you. They so you. much. Yeah. Yeah. And then everything becomes easier because they continue buying, they buy more and they're shouting it off the rooftops so that other people are flowing into you. So why not yeah. focus on successful customers instead of revenue? It, it's a- But many companies just simply don't. And it makes 
a lot of us very miserable inside those companies no kidding. because of those forecast calls and the pressure um, to focus on the sale versus the successful customer. And I, I think there's, you know, we we were fortunate to speak at, um, we've had a customer for about two, two and a half years. Um, we spoke at their sales kickoff last year and we met somebody in the hallway um, and he was like, there's, they have about 800 sellers. And he's like, you are a legend in our virtual hallways. And we're like, yeah. what? But like hearing that, right? And like, we, we had a great success story even from that SKO where somebody walked away watched my session on discovery calls, Kim's session on show me, you know me and walked away thinking none of that's going to work. And uh, he's like, you know what? These people haven't returned my call. I'm going to try this show me, you know me crap. And I'm going to see what happens. And they did. And they listened to somebody's podcast for 10 minutes, uh, sent a note to her. And I think within 10 minutes, got the reply, did that to two, three other people got a response and then wrote their, their senior leaders and said, I got to tell you, I thought this was all garbage and I tried it and I am a, I am a devoted fan. Like I cannot believe this worked. And that's just the coolest thing because you also think you've not only impacted their revenue and their potential, right. And their yeah. success, but the companies as well. And that kind of evangelism will last a lifetime. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Well, the time has just flown by. I've loved talking with you. I wish you much success. I know you don't even need it because you're already doing great, but much more success for this year and beyond. And I'm um, just grateful that you took the time to come and be on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for the honor of having me. It was just so nice of you. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Sales Talk for CEOs. You can find me at alicehyman.com. Be sure and connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know that you heard the show. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe, write a review, and share the show with another CEO.